that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 525th edition of Energy Week with George Harvey and the amazing Tom Fennell. 525, that's a lot. Yeah, it is. As a matter of fact, today, you know, usually we record on, the, on Thursday, but today happens to be a Friday because yesterday I had to go up to the hospital and have my new pacemaker checked, um, which, by the way, turned out to be functioning just fine which is nice. Um, Absolutely. To, so today is, this, is actually not the 1st of June, it's the 2nd. And right. it is the 11th anniversary of the first, uh, of the day that I first posted on my blog. Oh, yeah. okay. So I've posted every day for 11 years. Oh, which wow. Is, which is something. Busy, busy little bee. What's that? You're a busy little bee. Yeah, well, I, I'm kind of more like the, the tortoise who just keeps going. Anyway, <laughs> anybody, anybody who wants to read the articles that Tom and I are talking about can go to my blog, geoharvey.com, and click on the calendar, which for today's show will start with the 25th of May. Or you can go the to... The links take you right to the article. That's right. and Or you can go to the actual... Um, file or website that Tom use, Tom and I used to, to develop the show, which is the links are down lower on a page of a computer. So I guess having said that, Tom, you have more to say? Well, let, let us begin. Let's begin. Okay. Our first, our first uh, article comes from Clean Technica, and we have a, we have a picture of a Hand crew from the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, in the Navajo region walking back from a wildfire. You know, Tom. So they, they were working out, working all day, putting out a fire, and now they're going home. Blocking a fire or whatever it was. Every time I look at a picture like this one, my eyes hurt because the sun is shining straight into my eyes. <laughs> okay, what do you have for a title? Ask a scientist, quote, calling out the, the companies responsible for Western wildfires. There well, you go. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's worth talking about. Okay. The U.S. wildfire season used to last for about four months. These days, it goes on for six or eight months, according to the U.S. Forest Service. And in some places, it is now a year-round affair. Just seven companies accounted for a whopping 18.7% of total American emissions. That's almost 20%. That's almost a fifth. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's just seven companies. That's just seven companies. Wow. That's, that's right. So what do you do about that? Drop back 10 and punt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably what you do. Yeah. We, we I don't know what you can what what do you do, but we're going to move on. I think. Okay, well, let's do that. A nice picture of an airplane landing on a somewhat uneven airstrip. Yeah. You know what that airstrip reminds me of is pictures I've seen of airstrips that were made by the people in the cargo cult. Oh yeah. Have you ever heard of the cargo cult? Yes, I have. Yeah, they, uh, <laughs> they built their strips because they would figure that the U.S. airplanes would land on them, and they were like uh, gods to them. They believed that the airplanes were coming out of the sky, which is where their gods lived. Yep. And that being the case, everything in them was intended for, in the planes, was intended for these tribal people who, I think, lived in New Guinea. And, somewhere around there. Yeah, somewhere around there. And so they built air airstrips so uh, cargo planes would have a place to land to give the cargo to the to the correct people. <laughs> anyway, this what is... What can I say? Yeah, I don't know. Um, this is from the BBC. I'm just going to say that. 
and it has to do well you go ahead and read the 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 title France bans short flights to cut carbon emissions. Yeah. France has banned, no, please notice the tense, this has already happened, domestic short-haul flights where train alternatives exist to, in a bid to cut carbon emissions. The law came into force two years ago, um, two years before, uh, I'm sorry, please, the, the law came into force two years after lawmakers had voted to end routes where the same journey could be made by train in under two and a half hours. I've seen some pictures of the European trains. And let me tell you, they're far more advanced than what comes running through Brattleboro every day. Well, I'll tell you, Tom, years ago, I'm going back 20 years, um, but the situation has not changed. Uh, as I understand it. Years ago, I used to live in Winchester, New Hampshire, and I uh, worked in Washington, D.C., which is a kind of a long commute. So yeah. I would go down and then stay there for a month and come back and stay in Winchester for a few days and then go back. You were familiar with the, with the trains. Yeah, and, you know, I, I looked into the situation. When you figure the time that it would take to drive to the train to the airfield to stand in line there, you know, get through all the security clearances and so forth and so forth and so on. And then my son would probably drive me and, and go back home. So counting his hours and stuff like that, there really wasn't a big savings in going by air instead of going by train. So oh, I agree with you. It makes sense. It makes sense. And train was a whole lot cheaper but it was also a lot more comfortable. You could get up and go to the say, dining exactly. car. Yeah, exactly. I was just going to say exactly that. Yeah. And um, people have got this idea today that they've got to get to the destination in some short period of time. And I just don't buy it. Not anymore. I always tell people I'm in a desperate rush to get to bed by 930. <laughs> so should we go on? Yes. We have a picture here of a Ford F-150 Lightning. Let me get that, uh, that picture up here in front of me. Yeah, nice it's picture. It's a very long Ford, isn't it? I don't know. Is it? I guess it. I guess it's a, uh, yeah. Um, it's a slow motion picture or something. <laughs> Wait, the, 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 the car isn't that long. Okay. I'll buy it. <laughs> um, well, this is from Clean Technica. I was just going to say, it comes from Queen Technical. Yeah. And Queen Technica. Yeah. And it says, and I quote, Ford signs battery materials to you, hints at fixed pricing strategy. <clears throat> it's interesting how it's developing. You, you're, It's developing into the, that you buy your car, but you lease your batteries. Well, this is a, this is a, a winning combination. There's a, uh, let me read the synopsis. There's a torrent of news about Ford Motor Company this week. So let's get you caught up on recent developments. For a start, Ford announced a long-term contract with energy source materials to pur purchase the lithium it needs to manufacture EV batteries. Now, obviously, there was a lot more to this particular story than that, but that's where it started. And well, it's it's all waiting for the dust to settle. I mean, they're still experimental. Yeah. There's a lot of experimental stuff going on. And it's going to take a little time for the dust to settle. This is not a... Oh, for sure. Not something that's going to happen overnight. Um, I don't know. You know, it might be that 10 years from now, there isn't going to be any lithium used in, in EV batteries. I don't know. I just don't well, know. Well, for one thing, there is inertia. People have inertia on cars. Yes, and that's coming to an end because the new cars, the electric cars, are superior. Yeah, and cheaper. And cheaper. And cheaper. Okay. We're up to Friday, May 26th, unless you've got more to say, Tom. No, that looks good. we got some, some wind turbines in Finland there, huh? We do. And these actually are wind turbines in Finland, I know, because I looked it up. Oh, I believe that. Yeah, and you can tell from the name of the, of the uh, photographer... I don't know how it's pronounced, but I can tell you that that has to be a Finnish name. 
Okay, I'm this, not even going to try to pronounce it. Uh, no, I'm not going to try to pronounce it. I don't know how to pronounce Finnish. Well, let me read the title anyhow. Okay, do that. Electricity prices in Finland flip negative on a huge oversupply of hydroelectric power. Yes, Finland. Now that's interesting. Yeah, Finland had an unusual problem on Wednesday. Clean electricity was so abundant, it set, sent energy prices into the negative. The price drop uh, was, was driven by unexpected glut of renewable energy with the addition of a new nuclear power plant. And I want to I mention something about this nuclear power plant. There, were, there was just a, a, a large number of articles that appeared over a period of uh, maybe a week which said, they talked about how wonderful this new nuclear power plant was. Because, this is Finland now. Yeah, it came online and the electricity, po electric power wholesale prices dropped by 75%. Wow. Yeah, but there's a little bit of a problem with that story. And the little bit of a problem was there was more than nuclear power in that mix. Uh -huh. And one of the things is, the, co the cost of, of natural gas and, and so forth in, the, in, the, uh, in Europe has just plummeted for the whole continent. Um, and this is in res you know, because of the, the uh, uh, response to the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. And so the, the price drop in Finland was not just Finland. It was other places where there were not new nuclear power plants. Uh -huh. And there's a lot of push to make things simple, for one thing. People like simple ideas in the news. It's r really simple to say, yeah, this is be because of nuclear power. In fact, it was partly because of nuclear power. But the thing, when I saw the, the price that, was, that dropped by 75%, I knew immediately that that was not something. Not just nuclear. It was not just nuclear. The the prices, uh, wholesale prices in Finland had gone artificially high. So. Well, I've said it on the show before. I'll say it again. Yeah. It's not too many years from now. People are going to look back and they're going to say, "Imagine in those days, people actually paid for." Yeah, food. that's right. That is right. Okay, we have a picture of power lines. Looks like that to me. Okay, and this is from the Brunswick News. I'll take your word for it. Well, that's what it says. It's right in <laughs> front of my face. Says, right. <laughs> okay, go ahead. California breaks its record for renewable electricity. Yeah, California. Not at all surprising. Yeah, this is a little bit of an old record breaking, but you know they they just got the data put together to see that it happened. California has hit a new milestone in clean energy. In 2021, 37% of the state's electricity was generated by renewable sources like solar and wind, according to numbers recently released by the California Energy Commission. That is more than double the amount, 16%, uh, that, that was um, renewable in uh, 2012. So this is, this is the, new, the new trend. It went from 16% to 37% in nine years. Yeah, I, I think you're right. That's exactly what it is. So, um, you have more on that? No, and what I just said, you know, people used to pay for, pay for, pay for uh, fuel. Yeah. They yeah. don't have to anymore. <laughs> and it's it's going to take a while for it to filter down to the lowest Yes, revenue. I think that's right. We have basically, an, that's what's, what's happening. Yes, we have an article from Clean Technica and a picture of a Ford Mustang Mach E. Looks like that to me. And the thing that's important about this is that the Ford Mustang Mach E is recharging from a Tesla supercharging station. That didn't used to happen. No, it didn't used to happen. At least Ford not. electric cars to have this fast charging in the USA with Tesla supercharging. Yeah. Ford and Tesla announced together that Ford EVs coming to market that uh, that will include Tesla's supercharging port starting 2025. Before then, starting in early 2024, 
Ford will deliver, um, will offer adapters for its EV owners, so they will be able to make use of Tesla superchargers. Now, this is not. So Tesla's got the best best technology for charging. Uh, don't they? That seems to be maybe the case. I I don't know. Um, the 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 Ford uh, is, but Ford is offering going to be offering these adapters apparently to EV owners who are owners of Ford EVs now. I so, think we're going to talk about this later, but they're talking about recharging cars awful fast. Yes, they are. No question about it. It's going to be a different uh, thing than what it has been. Well, you're going to be able to recharge as fa fast or faster than you can fill up a tank with gas. Well, I think that's true. Yeah. Yeah. And... and you know, you, you've got detractors saying, but lithium batteries catch fire. I got news for you. The new ones don't. We'll, we'll new, talk about that, too. But the other thing is, have you ever seen a car catch fire at its gas tank? I haven't had the, the, the pleasure. The pleasure, yeah. I had, a, I had a friend who went into a gas station, and there was a young man in the gas station who... Um, was filling his car, and he got into the car. The engine was on while the gas was being pumped. And he had a very hot car, and he revved it, and it blew oh. up. Wow. Yeah. And people walk around with lit cigarettes in their mouths. I know. Yeah, absolutely. This is, <laughs> this it's is pretty careless, really. It is, indeed. Okay, we're up to Saturday. May 27th, and we have an item from Clean Technica. Nice picture. Yeah, it looks like a Ukrainian flag upside down. <laughs> Doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It's never thought of that. Yeah, well, I looked at that and I thought to myself, why does that look so familiar? Well, according, according to the title, it's a ship at sea. It could have fooled me. Yeah, well... <laughs> and no ship that I had ever seen when I was a kid looked like that. Of course, they, no, didn't, for sure. they, they didn't have container ships when we no, were kids. No, they didn't have that. Okay, this is from Clean Technica. No, there won't be nuclear-powered commercial shipping this time either. Yeah. A while ago, the author published a sexy practical quadrant chart for maritime shipping and decarbonization. He did not even include nuclear power for commercial ships in the chart because the idea was so obviously flawed from a business perspective. Well, we've seen it, seen it on a show, and it's interesting. Uh, they're, they're going to be coming across long strips of ocean with wind power again. Yes, they are. Yeah. and But the thing is, oh, the fuck? nuclear power, well, you know, I've mentioned this before. The United States used to have a fleet of nuclear-powered cruisers. And at least one of those cruisers was decommissioned be without ever having had um, a, 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 a had its nuclear power um, a refilled, it was still That's on its still on its first charge of of uh, yeah. of, ura of uranium when it was decommissioned, and the reason was because nuclear power for shipping was so expensive, just incredibly expensive. Uh huh. So um, I, I should say not for shipping, but for ships. So they, they gave up on it. And they have nuclear power for submarines, big advantage for submarines. They and have, for aircraft carriers. They have it for aircraft carriers. And the size of the aircraft carriers that we have today is so big, I hate to think of how much oil would be used. And, of course, that oil has to be— They could they can carry enough. I don't know, but you know they have to refuel at sea, and uh, it, that's that's an expense, a, an expensive operation. Okay, we should probably go on. What do you think? I think we should. Did I read this title? Which no, title? There be, no, there won't be. Yeah, you did. Okay, let's move yeah. on to the next one then. Yep. What are we looking at now? These are strange-looking birds. Yeah, they are. A lot of them, too. 
Uh-huh. Yeah, there's quite a few. That's it must the, be the North Sea or someplace. Yeah, well, it's the Beatrice Offshore Wind Farm. Although near where I was born in Kansas, there's a town that it has that name, and they don't call it Beatrice. They call it Beatrice. Okay. <laughs> this is from Energy Digital Magazine. And it says, I quote, SSE unveils plans to invest 40 billion pounds in clean energy. Yeah. And that's, by the way, almost $50 billion. It sure is. Scottish energy giant SSE, and I have no idea what SSE stands for. It's just what it's called. Promised to, del- to invest up to 40 billion pounds, which is actually $49.3 billion. So you're right. It's almost 50 billion in green energy in the next decade after seeing its annual profits almost double. So uh, renewable energy is more profitable than the old way of doing things. Jeremy Hunt, Chancellor of the Exchequer, I should have said Chancellor, that's what they say in the UK, said, what did they say? They say Chancellor. 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 Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the, how they say exchequer. I'm just going to leave it at this exchequer. <laughs> he said the pledge was a, quote, further vote of confidence in the British economy, end quote. I'm not uh, sure that's what it is, but I'll take his word for it for the time being. Okay, should we go on? Moving along. And yeah. What's missing in this picture is the solar panels on the roof. Yeah, I know. I didn't see one with solar panels on the roof, but, you know. They're, we they, have seen one in the past. Oh, we've seen more than one, and they are fun to have the solar panels on the roof. I want to tell you something, Tom. I had a, a colleague I worked with at one time who grew up in one of these buildings. No kidding. Her father worked on locust control for the United Nations. Oh, and, okay. And he lived out on the grassland, not in Ethiopia, in Kenya, but, you know, it's close. I don't know. That, yeah, I don't know that the, the sh- grass shack that she lived in. I, I don't think she called it a shack. She, she might have called it a hut, but she she loved living in that. And then half, after living up to the age of eight or whatever it was in in Africa in in that kind of environment, she went off to to Belgium where her family was, or the her father's family and went into a convent to learn formal education, and she absolutely hated it. She went in, into this stone building with <laughs> leaded glass windows that were, that were different world. Leak, leaky. It, the, the place she, she slept in was 30 degrees colder than anything she'd ever experienced in her whole life, and she was only allowed one blanket. Wow. So she had a hard time. But she loved living in one of these things. Okay, this is from Clean Technica. And what do you have for title? Off grid solar brings hope to remote villages. Yeah, hundreds of millions of people live in communities without any electricity. And that that round hut that we see there is is an example. The International Energy Agency says, quote, says, yeah. Almost um, 775 million people did not have any access to electricity in 2022. That's, a, that's amazing. Yeah, some of the largest of the populations are in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Solar power can bring some hope. And um, yeah, it's um, I, I've thought many times of the benefit that the United States would have if it just said, okay, we're going to pack a battery and solar panel and an inverter and, you know, whatever is needed to set them up and try to come up with a package that uh, costs a thousand dollars. And we're going to send that to everybody who needs one. And I just, I think that that would have do a world of good, not only in Africa, but in the United States as well. Sounds like a good idea to me. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, I don't think that we have to be, goody two shoes to be good people you know i hear what you're saying yeah and by the way have you ever read goody two shoes there's actually a book called goody two shoes no i haven't i have (laughs) and i can tell you why most people don't read it (laughs) okay we're up to sunday may 28th 
And what have we got? That looks like a mammoth. It, it does, doesn't it? If it's not a mastodon. It's a mammoth. It says so. In fact, I looked into it a little bit. That That is a, a, a full-size model of a mammoth, and it is um, covered with yak fur. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. This is from oil is, price. Is it, is it full-size? It must be. Is it what? Full-size. must be. I think so. Yeah. Okay, this mammoths. is... Mammoths. Yeah, go Sloths ahead. Sloths and camels are hurting the renewable revolution. I yep. gotta get closer to my screen here. <laughs> the U.S. needs new transmission lines, but faces opposition. The most recent transmission lines fiasco comes in the form of the Greenlink West project, which is to pass through an area famous for its fossils of woolly mammoths, giant sloths, and ancient American camels. Well, what the article said is that Greenlink West will cross the whole of Nevada from Vegas to Reno. Yep. Straight through the 40 square mile Tule Springs fossil beds, one of the most significant fossil sites in the U.S. Yeah. That's basically what this whole article is all about. Yeah. You remind me of somebody who was going to make a development in New Jersey, which was a, a, a commercial, like a a mercantile development. It was like a a shopping center was going to be built. And um, the people who were doing the initial excavation came up with dinosaur bones. So, oh, okay. yeah, the guy went to some authority and said, what should I do? I, I'd be willing to hold off on building this while people go in and get whatever bones they want to get. And they arranged for that to happen. So the, the person who was developing the land um, sat, sat back and waited and waited and waited and waited. And a year and a half later, nobody had gone to that property to find the dinosaur bones. Oh, no kidding. So he just bulldozed them. Went ahead and did what he was going to do. That's huh? right. That's what he did. Well, it's here sad, we got a picture coming up of a German bullet train. A German bullet train. I should put that up so people can see what it looks like. Um, yeah. Looks pretty sexy to me. Well, I don't know. You know. It looks yeah. like it's going 150 miles an hour standing still. Yes, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, but I wouldn't call that sexy. I would just call it <laughs> probably too fast. Okay, this is from CNN. Europe is trying to ditch planes for trains. Here's how that's going. Yeah. Now, we, we talked about this earlier uh, in regards yeah, to, to the fact that France was had already banned uh, uh, short-haul planes. There has definitely some, been some progress in Europe f for the move from planes to trains. Airlines, including Dutch carrier KLM, are entering into rail partnerships for certain routes, while countries like Austria and France are seeking to restrict internal routes where trains are available. Well, and, Europe has a very well-developed rail system. Yeah, it does. Much better than our own. Yeah, I was, I was absolutely stunned. Now, I'm going back here to the point where I was 15, and I'm, how old am I now? I'm 76. So it was 61 years ago. Um, I spent some time in Germany. And I went to Heidelberg, and I wandered around Heidelberg. But I stayed in the youth hostel, which was a little ways out of town. And how do you get to the youth hostel? Well, you take a, a, uh, a tram, electric tram, until you're close, and then you get off at the appropriate stop, and then you walk three-eighths of a mile, which is not much. And uh, that's what they did. And that tram went out into the countryside, into areas where women would get on the tram in the morning with big boxes full of eggs that they were taking to market. So these, these public transportation systems were going out into the countryside into areas where there were farms. Try selling that in the United States. Yeah, <laughs> it's a different world, isn't it? Well, it is, and I think those are still there. I might be wrong. I haven't, I haven't been in Germany for all the time since then. That was, what, 1962, 
63, 62, 62. Okay, should we I go on? I don't remember being in Germany. It was in the, in the late 50s, I guess, or early 60s. Same, same period of time. Yeah. And there was trains all over the place. The well, S-Bahn and the U-Bahn and the T-Bahn and the yeah. S-Bahn. Yeah, they were bond. everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. You could yeah. get from any place to any place else, it seems, you know, by train. You didn't need anything else. And How it was you get from Dublin to, to London, though? Dublin to London usually takes a little bit more than a train. <laughs> There's a bit of that that, you know, you can take a, sh a train to the, from Dublin to, to the Irish Sea, and you can take it from the Irish Sea to London, but you got to swim that crossing. So you got to be in good shape. you got to be in good shape, or maybe you could borrow a canoe. Okay, <laughs> um, I'm going to go to the next... Next, uh, I think it's time to stop being all that silly. These are not the these are not the same wind turbines we looked at earlier. They're different wind turbines. These guys are in Copenhagen, though. They're in Copenhagen. That's right. And I forget where the oh the other ones were in Finland, and Copenhagen and Finland are two different places. Okay, this is from CNN. Wind energy has a waste problem. New technologies may be a step closer to solving it. Yeah. Huh? Well, oh, I'm going to explain what they mean. Yeah, wind energy, uh, wind turbine blades have been difficult to recycle. So that's the that's the, pro that's that's the, the waste. problem. That's the waste problem. But, but Danish wind company Vestas announced a breakthrough solution, what it called literally a bre breakthrough solution. New Vestas technology would allow wind turbine blades to be recycled without needing to change the design or the materials, which yeah, means existing blades can be recycled using this technology. Well, so, it's definitely progress because uh, if you could not recycle them, they're going to be stacking up somewhere. Absolutely. Okay, we are up to Monday, May 29th. All day. All day. We have a picture of... Overcast sky. In New Zealand. In New Zealand. Well, it happens that this is in New Zealand, but, you know, it was it had to be somewhere. And it, it was New Zealand. Okay, this is from Earth.com. Continuous clean energy scientists are pulling power out of thin air. Yeah. In a, okay, I, 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 I put the emphasis on the wrong syllable there. I thought you had, yeah, but that's okay. People Continuous will... clean energy, colon. <laughs> Scientists are pulling power out of thin air. Yeah, in a groundbreaking study from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, I've been there. Engineers, right, right nearby. Yeah, I didn't go to school there, but I've been, you know. Engineers de uh, demonstrated the potential to produce continuous clean energy from humididdy. Yep. That's the musical weather phenomenon, humididdy. Humididdy, huh? That's yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> Some people call it humidity, uh, humidity but I, I think humididdy is much more fun. Uh, from humidity in the air. The secret is a porous structure at a nanoscale that can be put into virtually any material. Okay. And the scale means very, very small. Yeah, and I don't know what they mean by porous structure at nanoscale that can be put into any material. I, I tried to figure that out. I couldn't figure it out. But I did figure one thing out, and that is what they're talking about is, is gathering electricity from charges that, um, you know, electric charges that develop in humid air. And like when, when, like when a thunderstorm happens. Yeah. Thunderstorm happens. That so they're collecting those pro, those photons that are floating around. Not photons, protons, whatever they are. Electrons. Electro yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. They're gathering those guys. You were an electrical engineer? Are an electrical engineer? Something like that. Well, I'll tell you what. Just remember this. You are not a protean engineer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, life is confusing when you get confused. Um, yeah, there, there, you know. Hey, if you, you on that? Yes, you're allowed <laughs> to do that. You're allowed to say, George Harvey said this. And I will even admit that I get confused sometimes, which is why 
I know that. Um, it's a nice picture of a dam at a North Carolina mill. Okay, let's go to the next item. Uh, I'll put it up so people can see it. There it is. I see the dam in the, in, the, in the middle of the picture there. Yeah, and the reason that's there is because this is a piece of property that can be the, subje the subject of a flood. Um, so they okay. put the dam there to lessen the, the, the probability of flooding and damaging that house in the picture. Yes. This is from Clean Technica. What do you got for a title, Tom? UCS, whatever that means, releases online danger season map. Yes, this summer is projected by the uh, by NOAA, N O A A, which is the National Oceanic Oceanographic uh, and and Air, um, Aerospace, whatever. Now I told you I get confused once in a while. Uh, to be hotter than normal, and the UCS, which is the Union of Concerned Scientists, launched an online danger season map showing. Areas of the United States that are at risk for extreme heat, wildfires, storms, or flooding. The map will be updated daily through October. Well, that's a worthwhile thing to do. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Now, our next story... Your season map, huh? Yeah. Our next story is from the Bakersfield, Californian, and that is a picture of a Joshua tree. Greg, it's told us. That's a cool, cool little tree, isn't it? Isn't it? And I, I looked them up. Joshua tree is a type of yucca. So it's kind of a cactus, huh? No, yucca is not really cactus. And by the way, yucca will actually grow and thrive in the area that we live in. Is that so? Yeah, but not these guys. These guys are very specific about how much... They don't want to have a lot of water, and they want to have a certain altitude, and they want to have certain temperatures, and there's worry that they're going to have to move because they're they're getting to climate change. But what do you have for a title? And those Kern. Are the, yeah, and that's a county. That's right. It's a county. Plays a the big plays biggest role as California taps renewable energy to avoid blackouts. Yes. Um, state officials say California probably will not suffer any power outages this year. And this is for two reasons. One is because of snow melt, which will produce record hydroelectric power. No joke about that. They had a lot of snow last winter. And new solar and wind capacity and battery storage that are all coming online. And Kern County is a leader in that. And if you look at this picture, you'll see that there are Oh, I have no idea how many wind turbines there are in the background. More than several. There's more than I can fit in my pocket. I can tell you that. They more than I can fit in my picture. Yeah, it is. It's an interesting picture. I really kind of dislike seeing wind turbines in that kind of number. But, you know, I also dislike a lot of other things like steel mills and coal burning power plants and Stuff like that. Stuff like that. You know, I'd, I'd like to be in a world where everything is beautiful all the time. Okay. Um, we are up to Tuesday, May 30th. And we've got a picture of an industrial-sized heat pump. We have a picture. It is industrial-sized. It sure is. It's big. I'm going to put that up so people can see it. This is from the BBC. The exploding demand for giant heat pumps. Yeah. Heat pumps made by MAN Energy Solutions. MAN is all uppercase. I don't know what that stands for. It's, it's an acronym. It is. Are among the largest in the world with a heating capacity of up to 48 megawatts. Imagine one machine. That's big. One machine drawing 48 megawatts. We're not going to tell you what that can do in a second. Oh, you, you don't want to have 40, 48 megawatts jumping through your body. One of them could heat thousands of homes. That's right. We are in a time of urgent need to end the use of fossil fuels, especially in Europe. Quote, the demand for district heating is exploding, end quote. If you put, if you put one of these things, that's just, that's, 
Now, I, I have no idea how, t how tall that machine is, but guessing from the railings that I see in the background, I'd say it might be six feet, maybe seven feet. Yeah, somewhere along there. And that could produce enough heat to heat every house in Wyndham County. You know? Yeah. So there it is. And if you've got the... The, the, the times, they are changing. They are indeed. And, you, you know, when you're in a position like having, having an ability to do this, you could put that into a, a city where people in the past had been dependent on coal for heating their homes and, and businesses, and all of a sudden the smoke from that coal goes away. Okay, I'm going to move us on. Is that all right with you? Sounds like a plan. Okay. Our next picture is wind turbines. Wow. Looks like it to me. Yeah, and this is from Yahoo Finance. I guess that's a farm, isn't it? It looks like rows of crops. Well, that's, yes, that's some sort of farm. And I'm not even sure where it is. I think I knew at one point. I think that might be in, I don't know. Anyway, what have you got for a title? New Deplanetio commits to speeding up energy projects. Yeah. Well, yeah. U.S. financial markets breathed a sigh of relief after negoti negotiators from Democratic and Republican parties reached an agreement to raise the debt limit. Among the key provisions, the New Deal will make it easier for both fossil fuel and renewable energy projects to get licenses. And, um, you know, a lot of people were really livid about this. A lot of um, environmentalists were really upset. I think, you know, from my point of view, yeah, they're going to try to put in new um, gas pipelines and things like that. It's predictable. What is also predictable is that the plants that use the gas transported in those pipelines is probably not going to be sold because the new power plants are probably not going to be built. And the reason for that is because renewable energy is so inexpensive and... And it's getting cheaper. It's not just getting cheaper, Tom. It's getting better. It's more reliable than, yep, than totally. natural gas. And it's, it's higher quality electricity than natural gas because it's much easier to control. And you can get, using near firm solar or wind, you can get instant changes to, that match demand. And you can't do well, that. The, the opposition comes from people who are afraid of st stranded assets. Yeah. Absolutely. People will own the gas. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we should we should move on, Tom. I think. I think we should. We got an interesting picture of a motor. Of a motor, that's correct. And this is from Clean Technica. An EV drive unit built without rear earth minerals. Now this is important. It is. Just tell us what it what what it really means. Yeah, Vitesco Technologies came up with a really cool EV drive unit design. What really sets it apart from other designs is that it doesn't depend on rare earth minerals and permanent magnets. The unit also has certain advantages for efficiency because it does not have permanent man uh, uh, magnets. Now, I'd like they, to know how they do that. <laughs> I don't know how they do it, Tom. I really don't. But yeah, I, I, nor do I. It surprises me. Yeah, I, I feel like I know a little bit about, about uh, um, uh, rare earth minerals because I used to work with them. And uh -huh. I've handled literally tons of gadolinium in various forms. Gadolinium oxide, amorphous gadolinium oxide, crystalline gadolinium oxide, gadolinium, um, gadolinium, Chloride, gadolinium, gadolinium. Oh, what did we dissolve that in? It was, it was in chlor. We dissolved it in hydrochloric acid, and then we'd precipitate it out using. Oh, I forget. But you know, it was um, it was a long time ago. But I handled lots of this stuff, and I was familiar with it, and I was curious. So I would go learn about it. it. Gadolinium has a lot of very unusual uses. Uh -huh. And, you know, neodymium is another 
rare earth mineral. It's used in these permanent magnets. The thing about the rare earth minerals is not that they are rare because they aren't. They're actually rather common. Uh -huh. The thing is, they are, they are considered to be kind of rare because they are so hard to get apart. They're, they're almost always found as a group together. I was just going to say, they come together, don't they? Yeah, and they have um, uh, uh, the chemistry. Uh, their chemistry is such that it's, it's really, they, their chemistry is almost identical. So how do you get them apart? Well, you have to play some really heavy-duty games to get them apart, and that makes them really expensive. So at the time I was doing it, get, um, rare earth oxide, which is just whatever mix of, of them you could come up with, and the oxide was like $7 a pound. And gadolinium oxide, which was relatively pure, was like $30 an ounce. So it was really expensive. And um, that's the way they are. You know, neodymium, there's, there's millions of dollars worth of neodymium in wind turbines in any wind farm, any wind farm where it's used. And um, in neodymium, a, do they make stronger magnets? They make permanent magnets. Yeah, the rare earth magnets. When I, I my last car was a 2001 Prius, and it had a DC motor in it that was sure, about the size of, size of a grapefruit can, and it was 35 horsepower. Because no kidding. It, yeah. Wow. yeah. And now I'm accustomed to DC motors, and if if you said it's a DC motor and it's the size of a grapefruit can, how many horsepower? I would say I don't know. I would guess maybe. 0 0.2, 0 0.1, I don't know. And if you said that it was one horsepower, I'd say not the size of a grapefruit can. That's, you know, it's, that's big. You don't want a motor that big in your lap because you're going to feel like it's going to break you. I bought a car one time. I didn't keep it very long. Yeah. But it was a VW, VW station wagon. Okay. Not, not the bus, but the little wagon. Yeah. And the owner had... Uh, transformed it to an electric motor. Okay. And the electric motor was a DC motor. Oh. Obviously. Yeah. And it was big. It was big. It was oh, yeah. Absolutely. About as big as 10, 10 red boxes. Yeah. And wh how many horsepower was it at that size? 15? I don't know how many horsepower. The car, the car performed okay. Okay. But it had a whole mess of batteries in it. The whole, whole rear deck behind the seats was all batteries. Yep. Okay, Tom, we are up to Wednesday, May 31st. I should, I should keep going. I uh, think we should. We have a we picture. We got an interesting picture of a truck there. You're going to tell us what's on it. Well, it's transporting a wind turbine blade. But you you know, like when I me. see this, you know what I think? I think there should be a guy sitting on the back, you know, back where the back axles are with an independent what? steering system like the old... Like on a fire engine. Yeah, on the, on the old fire engines. So the the front of the of the truck and the back would steer separately from one another. Well, it's a very 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 seventeen very long truck. Yeah, it's a very long truck. That's right. Yeah, I mean, look at the at the thing that extends from the front to the back. That's basically just a big, probably steel thing. It's a it's a beam of sorts. And it's, it's sagging. Just, just a beam to hold the whole thing together. Yeah, yep. and it's sagging in the middle, for, and it's sagging from its own weight. Yeah. This thing is big. Okay, this is from CNN. What is permitting reform? Permit. What, what, what is permitting reform? That's right. The, the critical energy provision buried in the debt ceiling negotiations. They're yeah. That on the radio today. Yeah. People are still. You know, days after this, they're still pretty curious about what's going on here. Tucked into the bipartisan debt ceiling deal is a critical energy provision that Republicans and Democrats in Washington both want, at least in theory. Energy permitting reform, which aims to break, to cut down the time that it takes to get new projects approved. And that's what they're working on. There's no question. Well, the article about it. mentioned how long it takes for new projects to get approved. It's hard to believe. Oh, it is hard to believe. Yeah. Um, 
I think I, I mentioned in the last show that I saw that if you, if you calculated the amount of, of um, renewable energy that has to go online to replace all of our fossil fuel uh, uh, power plants, and then you compare that with the ones that have been proposed, you find we've actually had more proposed than we need. But the permitting is just not happening. Okay. Not at not at the at the rate that you would want. So. So, so a lot of it's still theoretical. Um, it's in a sense it's theoretical. Yeah. Okay. Should we go on? Can't dance. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This yeah, is from an interesting a, picture of a space launch. That's right. And this is from a place called Tech Spot. And I notice that there is no link. Uh, uh, the word tech spot is not part of a link. So that means people who want to read this article are going to have to go to geoharvey.com and find it there. This so is, research. Yeah. Uh, what you do is go to the calendar, go to the May calendar, click on the 31st. You'll have about 15 articles and you can find this among them. So what do you have for a title? Japan is on a mission to beam solar power from space yeah. by 2025. Now, yeah. that's coming up pretty quickly. It is, and beaming things from space implies satellites. So I put up a picture of a space launch from SpaceX, which is Elon Musk's space business. Oh, yeah. Yep. Japan's decades-long mission to transmit solar power collected in space back to Earth could move a step closer to reality in just a few years. A public-private partnership wants to start a trial sometime around 2025 using small satellites launched into orbit. And you know, Tom, this makes me nervous. How, how, how so? Well, you know, the idea, the idea here is that they've got something that is gathering energy in space and then beaming it to the Earth. And they're beaming it to some place on Earth. But how do they know that somebody isn't going to step on the, on the wrong side of that satellite and tilt it and send everything into downtown Los Angeles? Huh? <laughs> oh, you're right. They don't have, you can't, people don't step on satellites, do they? <laughs> but the, the thing is, it just bothers me that they would, they would just kind of assume that they can send amounts of energy. Well, that's what they're going to be doing. They're going to be generating the energy in space where the sun is very yeah. bright. Yeah. And they're going to return it to Earth yeah. by beaming it. Yeah. And is that... Sounds like a good idea to me. I don't know. If anything goes wrong with their aiming, you know, as I said, it's going to be... They burn somebody. They, they could actually burn somebody, yes. That would not be nice. So I'm a little bit I'm a little bit confused about this. I can understand the the uh, attraction of the idea, but it's I I, I want to see more than what they're going to give us before. I hear you. Yeah. Okay. This is our last story, I think. I was just going to say this is the, this one coming up is the last one. Yeah. This is from Renew Economy, and we have a picture of a Vesta's wind turbine. That's what it looks like to me. Yep. I couldn't. I couldn't swear it was a Vestas, but it certainly is a wind turbine. Sure, do, does look like it. Okay, what do you European have? European power prices go negative as renewables soar. You remember we were talking about nuclear power and how the how yeah, the power they're price paying of, you to take power. Yeah, they and the and the power price in Finland went down seventy five percent, and the pro nuclear yep. people are just saying, "See, this is from nuclear energy." Well, it ain't from nuclear energy. Okay, let me read the synopsis here. Balmy springtime weather across Europe and growing renewable energy capacity has led to, a, to multiple days of negative wholesale power prices, highlighting the need for increased energy storage capacity. A number of factors have led to consistent negative wholesale power prices for days. Well, it's certainly a good idea if you could generate energy cheaply enough to just store it. Absolutely. And you know what? 
That nuclear power plant that the nuclear people were claiming caused the price to go down in Finland, shut down. Yeah. It, it shut, shut down, down because they were losing money at the power prices that they were up against with renewable energy. Well, nuclear power plants are a thing of the past, I think. <laughs> Yeah, well, this one, unfortunately, is a thing of a past that only started about four days ago or five days ago. Well, as Bill Clinton would have said, it's, it's the economy, stupid. Was that Bill? I thought it was Hillary. Well, either one. Yeah, they, yeah. Okay. I, I'm not going to comment on Bill Clinton. I, I used to have a policy of, of blame, which was called Blame Bill. Uh-huh. And the, the, the way that I expressed this was if, if anything went wrong and it had anything to do with computers, anything, didn't matter what computer, what operating system, how big, how small, um, it didn't matter whether it was software, hardware, anything, it didn't matter, blame Bill Gates. He deserves the blame even if he didn't participate in the problem. That was my opinion. If I it met both of the Clintons once back in the South Carolina. Yeah. On a, on a beach in South Carolina. He, he wasn't president yet. Ah. Uh, well. Matter of fact, that's, what it, that's why he was there. He was running for president. Ah. Uh, but well, Bill and Hillary were together. Yeah. I had a, a similar thing about Bill Clinton, which was if anything went wrong and it didn't have anything to do with computers, blame Bill Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> this was, you know... Uh, this is based on the, 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 a principle that says you don't have to be fair about anything. <laughs> so there it is. Well, I think I got a word there that uh, sums it all up. What's that? Fini. Fini. That's right. And we are at the point in our program when we put up the final slide and in today... It says, have an incontestably gorgeous week. And at this time, I usually say, and I quote, you come back and see us now, you hear? <laughs> Tom, you're so good at quoting yourself. 